Hey there, marketers and marketing analytics students. In this video, we are going to talk about objective model calibration. So let's just remind ourselves of some key response model terms. So in the previous videos and exercises in class, we were building response models. And I say building response models in terms of setting those parameters, right? Those beta zeros or beta ones. But we did it in a subjective manner. We just plugged values in and we sort of looked at the math model relative to the data and just saw if it fit well. What we want to do here is we want to think a little more carefully about how we can do it objectively, meaning can we use some sort of metric to actually tell us what the correct model ought to be? So to motivate this example, uh, let's look at some data that we see here. On the x-axis, we see a coupon percentage off rate. So each dot here represents a email marketing campaign, a unique email marketing campaign. On the x-axis, we see the percent off coupon. So this is what was in the subject line of the email advertising a, per, a particular percentage off. We were curious if advertising a particular percentage off stimulated the open rate of the email. Open rate being if we had a open rate of one, that would mean 100% of all the people who were sent to the email opened it. And if it was zero, zero percent of the people opened it. Of course, we would like to have a high open rate from a marketing standpoint. And of course, there's other things beyond open rate that's important um, downstream. But for us, we're just going to focus on open rate right now. Now, let's look at these four potential response models. These dotted lines are simple linear models. So they just have a y-intercept and a slope parameter. The math model is depicted in the legend below. If I gave you these four different response models and I asked you to pick the one that you think best represents the relationship between the coupon percent off rate and the open rate of the uh, email campaign, which one would you pick? Most people easily dismiss the blue one, model C, because the data appears to have a positive linear relationship and the blue one is clearly negative. Most people also quickly dismiss the red dotted one because the observations that we see, the black dots, is are well above. And then typically there's a little bit of debate between model B and model A, where most people tend to say that between the two choices, model A appears to fit the data a little better. Now, how did we actually go about making that decision? As we've emphasized in previous conversations, we said, well, we eyeballed it, right? We just looked at the observations and we said, yeah, it looks as though the um, data is closely fit to one of the particular models. But we need to do something better than just sort of relying on these, these eyeballing approaches, right? We need objective model calibration. So how do we actually calculate with specificity precisely uh, how error prone a particular model is? So we are going to try to pick a good math model and then pick good parameters for the model and make sure that it's accurate and relatively simple. There are three different loss functions, mean squared error, root mean squared error, and mean absolute error that are very typically used to establish the amount of error or uh, the how the model is actually performing. I also note here there's a thing called mean absolute percentage error or MAPE and I will only say for uh, our purposes I often see MAPE being used but it is objectively wrong to use uh, MAPE. It should never actually be used so we'll just make a note here like do not use this so let's just stick with these simple three. Okay so let's start with some basic building blocks. Now we have just a few observations these little blue rectangular or square things here. And we have our response model. Now, one way we could establish how well the model fits is simply by calculating absolute 
error. Literally just measuring the distance between what the model says, that's the line, and what the observations are. And when I say we take the absolute error, well, that's because obviously the model can be wrong in two different directions, right? It could under predict or over predict, but from our perspective, it's error nonetheless. So we need to take the absolute value to make sure that we correctly just account for the error in either direction. Now, the second and common way that we calculate error is we quite literally just make squares. So rather than taking just the line as a depiction of error, we literally take the measurement of the error and square it. And by squaring it, we literally make a square <laughs> and calculate the area of that square, right? Area of square is just side squared and that's the area. So now our errors are calculated in a slightly different fashion. These two approaches, just taking the absolute value or actually deriving the square are probably the two most common ways that we calculate the poor performance or lack of performance in our models. So if we understand the idea that we just simply can calculate error in these two different ways, well, how do we aggregate all of those uh, metrics together? Well, one common way is calculate the mean absolute error or MAE. And what you see here is we have our absolute value and we have our summation. So we literally are summing up all of those little straight lines that we measured, right? And then we divide by N. I see it says one divided by N times. That's just ultimately just saying that we're dividing the summation by the number of observations. In other words, we're taking the average, the mean absolute error. So if we sum these all up and divide by six, because we have six observations, we get a mean absolute error of 0.916. That tells us in absolute terms how, how far off our model typically is from our predictions. And of course, our goal here would be if we're using mean absolute error, we would want to try to minimize that number, right? We, we would want a low mean absolute error. And of course, absolute error can never get below zero, right? We, at best, our model could be perfect and we have no error. Now, the other option is the mean squared error. Exact same idea, but now we're using those squares that we talked about earlier, right? So and again, quite literally, we just sum up the values of each one of these squares, and then we divide by the number of observations. In the example, we only had six, so the mean squared error is 1.042. And the same idea here, we just want the mean squared error hopefully to be relatively low. The lower it is, the more superior the model is at depicting or predicting where the data is. Another thing that you might often see is the root mean squared error. And root mean squared error is the exact same thing as the mean squared error. We just take the square root over the entire thing. So I'm only alerting you to this just so that if you see the root mean squared error, it's like, yes, the term is actually very helpful. It's the exact same thing, just with the square root, okay? And one of the reasons that we like the root mean squared error is because the taking the root of it makes it a little easier to interpret uh, in practical terms uh, what this value actually means. Um, but again, the fundamental issue of we, we would like to have this number hopefully be relatively low. Now that we have some basic understanding of common loss functions, right? Loss being here, like how much our model loses the ability to represent the data. Uh, this feels very much just like a little bit of a technical exercise, right? Like, yes, this is a thing your professor might ask you to do in a homework assignment or in the classroom, but like, why does a marketing analyst need to be aware of how to calculate these things and what they mean? Well, the issue here is that these provide an objective criteria to select between alternative models. So let me give you an example here. Uh, you might be familiar with a company named Rover. I'm just using it as a hypothetical example. Rover is um, a, I think, I think of it as Uber for dog walking or Uber for pet sitting. And for Rover, just like Uber and other sort of gig economy companies, it's very important that they measure the value of not just the people who buy services on the platform, but the actual gig workers who use, who uh, engage in um, 
business on the platform. So Rover here has a goal of they want to predict the customer lifetime value of people who actually engage in the walking on uh, the Rover platform. And predicting CLV is very important, right? We want to know the lifetime value of these different workers. If we can get it right, like we can actually predict who is going to be more or less valuable, Rover can really focus its energy on maximizing the value of those high customer lifetime value uh, dog walkers. So let's imagine there's a scenario here where you have the chief marketing officer of Rover, you have the VP of marketing uh, for Rover, and then it's you. You are been hired, congratulations, and you're a new junior analyst working for Rover. Now, if it's time to build these complex response models, uh, prediction models for CLV, well, the CMO, he may have hired a consulting team, right? A specialist consulting team who precisely does this work. And the VP of marketing, uh, maybe with their advanced degree, and maybe they've taken some additional online courses, they say, hey, you know, I've done, uh, I've done this type of work before. Um, they use Excel to build a CLV model. And then there's you. Now, You've probably never built a CLV model, uh, and if you have, maybe you did it in a sort of constrained classroom environment, and this is your first sort of really big high stakes gig, right? And you build a model nonetheless, like you took some of those skills and you do it. Now, which of these three models do you think is likely to be the model that Rover uses uh, to predict the customer lifetime value of their rover walkers. Now, if you think about internal corporate politics, uh, the chief marketing officer with their expensive consulting team is very likely to win here, right? Uh, they have the clout and they spent all the money, uh, AKA sunk cost in building this model. And it's very unlikely you, the junior analyst, uh, that you have enough swag in the company for you to actually uh, influence in them to, for them to adopt your CLV. However, what if you took your three different response models and compared them against the actual data of some of your customers on a head to head basis? If the chief marketing officers mean absolute error of their model from the consulting team was $150 VPs was 50 and yours was 25 all comparing themselves against the same data. Well, now, rather than you having to worry about office politics, you have clear, objective evidence that your model is outperforming other competing models. So hopefully the chief marketing officer has a enough humility to recognize the brilliance of their new junior analyst because this objective criteria makes it clear that you're doing a wonderful job. So that brings us back to our initial prompt here. I have calculated the mean squared error, the RMSE, and the MAE for each of these four models. You can see it reported here in the bar chart on the right-hand side. Now, according to these results, which of these models is objectively the best fit of the data? And if we remember, low is good, the answer is model A, because the mean squared error is lowest, the root mean squared error is lowest, and the mean absolute error is lowest. And we might also recall we had a little bit of debate between model A and model B, and you can even see that here in our calculated results, right? Both of these have seemingly much lower MSE, RMSE, and MAE compared to model C and model D. Now, in the previous example, all three of our metrics, uh, metrics, MAE, MSE, and RMSE, all agreed, right? They each said one of the models was the best. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So let's look at some different data here and these three different math models. Now we have two linear models. And we also have a slightly more complex power series model. Now don't worry about the fact that it's a little more complex. That's not the point of this illustration. The point of this illustration is just that we have three models that are competing. Now let's take a look at the RMSE, MSE, and MAE of these three different models. Which of these three models is superior objectively? Well, from an RMSE and MSE standpoint, and these two will always agree, model A is superior, our green linear line up here. 
However, if we look at mean absolute error, we see that model B is superior. Ah, so unfortunately, when you calculate loss, aka, AKA error differently, in other words, squared error versus absolute error, sometimes you might get different results about which model is superior. So that reveals that we should be mindful that when we select a loss function, we are consistent with its application and we understand that it may not indicate across all potential criteria that the model is superior. Now, mean squared error and mean absolute error and RMSE are strictly speaking only good for telling you about the accuracy of your model, how well it fits. But indirectly, you can also use these a little bit to help you manage model complexity. And when I say model complexity, I mean quite literally just more mathematically complex response models are less desirable from a marketer standpoint than simple models. We like simplicity, but we also want accuracy. And these two things can sometimes be in tension. So let's see an example of how MAE and MSE can sort of help us manage this model complexity in an indirect fashion. So let's take a look at these four response models. Model one is a linear model. Model two is a power series to the second power. Model three is a power series to the third power. And model four is a power series to the fourth model. Shown here. Now, which model is most complex? Quite literally, we just look at the complexity of the math here and we can say, yes, model four is more complex and model one is more simple. So we prefer model one from a simplicity standpoint but we also want accuracy. Well, let's calculate, just as one example, mean squared error across these four different models. Notice that when we go from model one to model two, there's a drastic improvement in the model error. In other words, I'm just pointing you out to the, the visualization here of seeing the large decrease. But when we go from model two to model three and model three to model four, we see relatively marginal decreases. The intuition here is from model one to model two, it is indeed more complex. However, we appear to be gaining a lot more accuracy. And when we go from model two to three and three to four, those gains in accuracy start becoming a little less obvious. We have to start questioning if adding this complexity is really worth it. So that's one indirect way we can use these um, loss functions as a way to sort of help us manage model accuracy and model complexity. Now, another thing to keep in mind is there is no rule that you just can't build your own loss function, right? Um, sure, mean absolute error and mean squared error are very common, but there might be very specific circumstances where you might have to build your own custom loss function. And this actually happens in a lot of business settings. But rather than using a business setting to illustrate why you might build your own custom loss function to help calibrate your model, let's think of the Price is Right and the Showcase Showdown. Um, if you're not too familiar uh, with the Price is Right, the Showcase Showdown show has two different competitors and each one of them are shown a set of fabulous prizes and they're different fabulous prizes. And then each person bids on what they think the total combined price of those fabulous prizes are, at least the ones they were shown. And then the winner, which person gets to take home their showcase of prizes is determined by the following rule. The person who gets closest to the price of the true price without going over is the winner. In other words, if the total value of the price of the of the prizes is $10,000 and you guess $10,002, you automatically lose because you went over. So, as you can imagine by rules of this game, you would have to think about building a loss function very carefully. You want an accurate model, but you would want a model that systematically always has a propensity to underguess the price of the showcase, right? You do not want a model that ever accidentally makes over predictions because then you automatically lose. And that'd be really sad if you made it all the way to the showcase showdown. So this would be a situation where because of the business rules, AKA the particular um, game show 
business, I guess, could be like a game show in a way. Uh, we, we might have to build our own sort of custom rules. Okay, let's take a little refresher on our friend R squared. Uh, for everyone taking my course, that means you've passed an introductory statistics course and you have definitely seen R squared previously. Let's just do a little, a little quick reminder about what this even is. So first, the, here's the equation. R squared is simply equal to one minus SS residual divided by SS total. So the equation itself is not particularly complex, but we do need to understand what SS residual and SS total or the sum of squares of residual and sum of squares of the total is in order to actually calculate and under, or more importantly, understand R squared. If we look at R squared carefully here and we see what residual and total are, we notice in our equations that we are literally calculating squares. See how we're taking one value, subtracting from another, and then squaring it? We are literally going to make some squares. Let's see this visually depicted. Here's some data. We have our uh, predictor on the x-axis and our outcome on the y-axis. And one of the ways we could build a model, a response model, is by really not building one at all. Rather, we could simply just guess the average for y. Meaning if we look at these one, two, three, four, five, six values, we could completely ignore the input and just say, eh, our model just says that uh, all future values will simply just be the average of y, our dependent variable. So that would be, in this case, we calculate the average and we get 2.583. Then we, of course, get, just get a horizontal line whenever you just uh, use a constant. Well, if this was our model, we have some error. And as we've seen, we can depict error through the use of squares. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six squares here. And our intuition should be like, well, when our average is particularly far away from one of the observations, our error for one observation will be large. We see that here on the right-hand side. But occasionally, our just guessing the average might be quite accurate. And we see that here by this little tiny square where the area of the square was calculated to be only 0.01. And if we sum these all up, which is what we're doing here according to SS total. Now, think of that as our baseline, right? We could just guess the average. But what if we did something a little more complex? What if we actually built a more complex model? And this more complex model here is a, it's still a relatively simple linear model, but it's a linear model is certainly more complex than just guessing the average because now if we look over at the equation here for the green group, we can see that we're using information about the input. Look at the equation. One is our constant, our y-intercept, plus one times x. So we're adding in more additional information. And when we build this model, if we used it, we would still have some error. And we, again, just calculate the error for this model using squares, just as we did previously. Okay, so now that we took all of these squares of our complex linear models, so these are all the previous squares, and according to the equation, I just summed them up. So I summed up, and then it says I need to divide that by the sum of the square of the total, which was us just using the average as our guess. And we place it down here. See, there's literally a division down here if you look at the equation. So I take the sum of the squares of the total, and there's proportion inside, and I just do the math, right? So r squared equals 1 minus 6.25 divided by 9.71. And I just do the arithmetic all the way through, and we get 0.356. OK, so we got to the final number. Now, normally, this number is just given to us. Like, we don't really usually have to calculate it ourselves. It's something you just do in intro stats class. But what does it mean? Like, what? how do we actually interpret it? Is 0.356 good or bad? First, I want to point out a couple incorrect intuitions that many uh, marketing young marketing analysts have. First, I've heard people think that if R squared is below 0.5, it's bad, and above 0.5, it's good. This is a completely incorrect intuition. You must reject that idea entirely. For, and we can reveal that by understanding 
the interpretation. So the interpretation of 35.6 is simply, in total, the prediction from our model accounts for 35.6% of the variation in our Y variable. And that tells us something important. We now have this ability to capture some of the variation in our dependent variable. And that's a really fancy way of saying we want a model that can predict with some accuracy um, our dependent variable, the outcome. And this tells us something else. If our R squared is a seeming low value, even say 0.1, well, in some situations, capturing say 0.1, which would be 10% of the variation, might be great. That might be the absolute best we can do. Capturing some variation in our outcome is better than none if that's the only alternative we have. Now, there is a problem with relying on R squared alone to decide if your model is good or bad, right? If we want high R squared, right, all the way up to potentially one, one would mean we capture 100% of the variation in the Y variable. We haven't thought about the problem of potentially overfitting our model. When I say overfit, I mean, we have literally built a model that has excessive parameters. So those are like, for example, in this red line equation over here, we have way too many parameters that are chasing after probably noise or random variation in the data that really shouldn't be part of a model that we're trying to build. And if you look at this green line and this red line, you'll notice that the red line with this wave of squiggles here has a very high R squared. And our green line has a relatively lower R squared. So this illustrates how if we just looked at the R squared, we wouldn't realize that we probably overfit our model. And we have a math equation here that's probably chasing after random noise in our data, and we have no good theoretical reason to keep it. Our green line, on the other hand, might actually make a little more sense. So given that we have some desire to build a model that captures this um, variation, but we also want to make sure we have a little simplicity, right? We don't want to overfit our model. This is where a tool like adjusted R squared can come into play. Let's take a look at the equation. So what I want you to appreciate here is that the R squared is still part of this equation. There's also an adjustment for the sample size, how much data you're working with. But the part I just want you to appreciate is here, the number of predictors. Remember, we've learned that as you add more and more predictors into your model, you're making your model more complex, right? You're bringing in more inputs. It's literally a more complex model. We don't desire that. Like ideally, we want a simple model. So one of the things that you can appreciate by this equation here is we have R squared, which lets us know about our model accuracy. And we also have the number of predictors in here that deals with model complexity. So this equation is, or this, um, yeah, this equation is designed to help us guide sort of this balancing act between complexity and accuracy. So let's go back to four different models that we saw earlier in our lecture. And we saw the simple one to the most complex. This time, I have actually calculated not just the R squared of these four models. Notice here, model one, model two, model three, and model four. I've also calculated the adjusted R squared. And the blue line represents R squared. And if you look at this, you can see that R squared continues to go up as we add more, more and more complexity to our model. However, adjusted R squared goes up for a while, then peaks at model three, and then declines. What's going on here? Well, adjusted R squared is literally adjusting our R squared for the increasing levels of model complexity. So from the perspective of adjusted R squared, we've gotten some very clear guidance. It actually says here, Model three, the blue model, is our preferred model. It's the model that is the most accurate while also balancing uh, simplicity and complexity. Okay, everybody. So we have wrapped up our conversation here about fit indices, loss functions, and R squared and adjusted R squared. What do we have to do next? 
well, let's jump on into our Excel assignments and start applying some of these techniques to helping us identify which model is best. See you in the worksheets.